Welcome again, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science. As always, you know you can support these programs at oxum.substack.com or at patreon.com slash oxum. Today, our special guest is Nate, and he said it very beautifully off of the recording, but longtime mutuals, first time caller. We'll repeat it for the audience. Thank you for coming onto the program. <laughs> Man, it's so cool to be here, dude. I I love, I mean, for all the bad things you can say about technology, and I do say many of them, um, I, I love the chance to to be able to look on your face, gaze on you digitally, even uh, <laughs> even as maybe not as ideal as that is. So good to be here, man. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, I feel similarly, and we'll, we'll get into that. I think that's one of your more popular articles on Substack. So I want to um, get into that, but I talk a lot about religion on my program, and of course, within that, most specifically Christianity, although I do have some interest in, of course, religions outside of that. I, I notice, um, and you'll correct me wherever and whenever I'm wrong, but you're an American in the Anglican tradition. Can you can you talk about that and, and say that specifically? I say that as a person who used to work at a, an Episcopal school. And as far as I know, yeah, yeah. the kind of American branch of Anglicanism since the Revolutionary War has been that, although, of course, I know uh, not everybody's on the same page about everything worldwide. Yeah, that's the understatement of the century. Um, <laughs> probably, there there is definitely confusion when it comes to using those terms, Episcopalian versus Anglican. They're essentially referring to the same. Uh, maybe it'd be helpful to say that they are, well, I think you've already said it. Nationally, people would think of Episcopalian, Episcopalianism as American and would think of Anglicanism as English which indeed that is what anglican means it is of the angles um of the, the british isles right so it's um it is kind of a i don't want to say a misnomer but i think there is a movement um back towards uh sort of a full embracing of the english tradition the christian tradition that anglicanism embodies at the time of to your point at the time of the revolutionary war at the time that it, that settlers were coming to the Americas, uh, it wasn't cool to be English. Mm -hmm. And so like, why would we have a, why would we have a body that is identified by our English descent? Like we, we want to sort of distinguish ourselves from our, from our English um, brothers and be our own American thing, which is a very American impulse. Uh, and so hence yes. a, uh, Episcopalianism came onto the scene. And so, yeah, I do, I, I, if you went to an Episcopal church and you went to an Anglican church, uh, you're going to, in some ways, a very similar thing, uh, a very different thing in a lot of other and important ways, but yeah. Anglicanism is, is a, an Episcopalianism are under the same umbrella. Yeah, and as far as I can tell, having only spent a year in an Episcopal institution, but having been familiar with people of that background for a while and anyone who's a proud american should be because you you start to see and notice some presidents from this tradition um is i i think what we're kind of softly referring to and like you said it's an understatement is this sort of um and and, and there was a revolutionary kind of spirit since its founding in america which by the way i usually favor for example i was rereading recently this great article on Britannica from one of my favorite journalists of the 20th century, H.L. Mencken out of Baltimore. And he's one of these rare, powerful, great American writers who catalogs the difference between so-called Americanisms. And often it's the sort of rhymey or almost rhymey funny words like heebie-jeebie and stuff mm -hmm. like that are uniquely American. But sometimes it's old kind of 17th and 18th century English archaisms that continued in the Americas because they were frozen here, whereas back in uh, the UK, they, they would have disappeared. So I know there's those differences, but I do mostly think it's those, those social issues, which I think kind of begins with women's ordination in the 70s. And of course, you know, uh, uh, we're in Pride Month here in the US, you know, th those um, th thinking of who and what 
uh, are the qualifications of, uh, I think, the priesthood and, and matters around there that I have noticed. And, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, the global south. That's why I was more interested in in America. I didn't understand kind of like structurally, are you guys connected to the Archbishop of Canterbury while in America? Or how, how does that practically work? Because I'm, I'm honestly ignorant about that, but I understand what you mean about kind of being more proud of that English heritage, whereas in the past people were not. Yeah, so the Archbishop of Canterbury is in Canterbury, which is the historic see of the of English Christianity. And that's an arguable statement, depending on if you're talking to a Roman Catholic or not. Um, but uh, so the so there's a big discussion right now uh, about what does it actually mean to be Anglican? Do we have to be in uh, in fellowship with and table like an altar fellowship with the See of Canterbury to be Anglican? Some people would say yes. Some people would say, eh, uh, who cares? Um, like if it's if they're um, heretical and corrupt, then why? Like what should it matter besides the fact that it's a historical tie? Um, but if it's merely an historical tie and doesn't have some real substance beyond that, if we can't agree on Nicene Orthodoxy, mm -hmm. as the Baptists are having that discussion right now, yes. uh, and if you can't, um, uh, if we can't agree on issues of what it means to be man or woman, uh, which I'm sympathetic that, to that discussion, so I, I don't disparage that conversation. But um, if we can't agree on holy orders and whether or not it's a, a male only priesthood, like there's all these questions, right? If we can't agree on that stuff, then what does what does uh, being in communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury do like what what good does that do and so yeah it's um it's very tumultuous at the moment to be an anglican and or episcopalian um i think that that the the lines are are somewhat blurring between the two i think some of the some of the defining edges would be around political and social teachings like that's what would maybe more clearly distinguish the one from the other but even that's not a like a neither one of them are, are monoliths right like each one has a little bit of the other in the other um and so you could go you can find churches that would identify as anglican that lean a little further left socially and politically you can find episcopal churches that are in fact quite conservative and recognizably catholic um it it, it kind of it spans the the spectrum there but generally um their episcopalianism in america is more leaning uh, and in communion with the archbishop of canterbury and anglicanism is a little more right-leaning uh and does not officially have communion with the archbishop of canterbury and yet maintains this historical lineage and tradition of the book of common prayer the 39 That's, articles of religion, uh, the book of homilies, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's very fascinating, especially that liturgy of ours that you have, the book of common prayers, I've always found fascinating. So that is a very American thing to be kind of more right of center than the other institution, but to be uh, not quite connected to the the um, I don't know if it's the homeland, you know, like that's that's very interesting. I wasn't sure about that. And then I was wondering if it would be like connected to any of the Anglican communions, whether in like South Africa or in India. I remember seeing he may have passed away by now, I think. But there was an interesting Indian gentleman who had made his Anglican church in India look like the Syriac church pretty much. And it seems that that's some of the flexibility in, in addition to having worked at an Episcopal school, I had um, an Episcopalian uh, priestess who was my uh, one of my law school professors. And she had told me one of the fascinating things that I, I think you may be able to clarify. But for example, in her tradition, she was fully garbed doing high church Anglicanism on Sunday mornings. And in the afternoon, she had a Pentecostal worship that she would lead without any incense at all. 
Um, and so I'm wondering within your tradition, then is it is everyone pretty much high church or is there um, flexibility between low church and high church within your tradition? Very flexible. Um, it'll it'll vary from parish to parish, which I think is maybe a. Well, it sometimes it's a strength, and sometimes it's uh, not so much of a strength of the Anglican tradition. Is that there's mm -hmm. some there is that flexibility, that that uh, breadth to be able to take what is traditional, like take what is Christian, and locally adapt it to the temperaments and needs of the local parish. Um, and by parish, I don't necessarily mean church. I mean like oh. the geographical area. Okay. Um, so like if there are, and that's kind of the more English way of conceptualizing what a parish is. It's a reference to geography rather than to a particular church building. Um, and in America, it doesn't all, the word parish doesn't often function that way. It, it is more of a reference to the church. So either the church or the local area, uh, whatever the needs are of that area, whatever local adaptations need to be made to more uh, fully and um, to use maybe a, a sloppy word efficiently, uh, lead people into a life with Christ then those liturgical or other adaptations are allowed to be made with the, the bishop's permission. Um, so you do have very low church expressions of the faith. You also have very high church expressions of the faith, and they might both happen in the same diocese, which I don't know, is kind of annoying because I like uniformity, <laughs> but also I get it. And like, I, I don't, it's one of the features of Anglicanism that I've come to um maybe appreciate isn't quite the right word but i can understand uh why it is way even if i don't particularly enjoy all of the expressions that come as a result of it yeah i can i can appreciate that. it's funny that you and we were talking about americanisms earlier but i had that kind of narrow view of the kind of building and community of parish and the way you're describing it as a region is actually a parallel between then England and Ethiopia, because that's the understanding in Ethiopia. As an example, there's an area called Afar, or alternatively the Danakil region, which is the hottest region on earth. And it's in mm. the lowlands rather than the typical Christian highlands, but there are some churches there now. And during fasting seasons, uh, which we are, we're approaching our Pentecost is coming up this Sunday. And after that will be a, a fasting period. So during fasting season, when you have a weekday liturgy, the liturgy doesn't begin at the normal time at 6 a.m., but instead at 12 uh, at noon. And so that means you're really not eating till about 2 to 3 p.m. And so especially in the hottest place on earth, that could start to get brutal. And so one of the kind of local uh, economia or, uh, you know, this is not a liturgical reform per se, but I mean, it's related to the, the start of time. So the chronology of the liturgy is they've allowed those people in that hot region to locally, and not just a one parish, but anyone that opens there to begin the liturgy at 10 a.m. instead of at noon during uh, fasting periods. So that's kind of an example of the flexibility you guys are doing. Additionally, we have um, kind of uh, outside of the Eucharistic liturgy, there are non-Eucharistic uh, liturgical expressions and hymnography. A lot of the times that's when you see our instrumental worship. Our liturgy is typically instrumentless, um, like the other Orthodox. But whenever you see our ornate walking sticks and the sistra, the clanky things, and the, the drums, that's usually our extra Eucharistic liturgical worship. Um, though those things have differences too from from region to region and so while we might not get as vastly different as you guys i i think this is uh, a comparison that that we can draw between the two and um and on another note there's this uh, american historian that is russell i appreciate he talks a lot about this this mind body dualism issue where a lot of academics they're very much in the mind and so they neglect the body one of the things i've appreciated about your writing especially on x is how much you emphasize manual labor and i think mm -hmm. it's from you that i learned the latin 
which by the way, from my Spanish, I, I understood what it meant immediately. Ora et labora. I don't know if I'm pronouncing mm -hmm. that right, but mm -hmm. in Spanish, that would be like oración y, la, y labora. <laughs> so, uh, right. Prayer, prayer and work. Um, could you could you talk about that that principle and, and how you unite? I really like that, and I think it's an ancient monastic principle. But I think more and more people should come to understand that concept. Yeah, and it, and this is another of the you mentioned economia earlier, and that that concept is very ancient to the church, um, and I think it makes an inroad into Anglicanism by way of the Benedictine heritage of English, of English Christianity. Because St. Benedict was very, if you read his rule, he was very yeah. concerned with making accommodations to the needs of his monks. If they were elderly, then it wasn't as strict. If they were young, it would be more or less strict, depending on the needs of the individual, how much of a jerk the the new monk was or or like you know that just the the difficulties of of um of adolescence uh in a monastic context like sometimes you'd be a little more harsh sometimes less uh the times of years and the way that that you got more and less sunlight and therefore the oh. uh the t times of prayer might shift earlier or later as you were mentioning uh just a minute ago um so yeah so that is that's very much a benedictine thing um which we might say is a patristic thing and i think it's in the it's in that patristic heritage that you you go over to ethiopia you go up to the british isles and it makes it makes its different expressions in those different places but that's ultimately how the anglican i think that's part of what shaped the anglican um ethos of pastoral uh making economic economia uh type pastoral decisions that account for the local need um so all of that to say um it is also from saint benedict that i get that phrase or at labora which i actually have tattooed on my hands or nice. at labora yeah work and prayer the things that my hands um and that it has been such a such a boon to my own spiritual life to my own following of of our lord and savior uh just the fact that we uh are not restrict we are not brains in a jar we are embodied um, creatures we have um this is, i think back to the garden and like in the garden there was no die and go to heaven right it was the garden was precisely the plane of existence that god intended for adam and eve to fellowship uh with him in it was it was this physical embodied material existence was precisely what he intended it's not the it's not trapping us and keeping us from him indeed it is putting us into direct contact with him through the things that he has made and this is you know the sacramental principle at some level like maybe a small s sacral idea but i think that through manual labor i have learned more about prayer and the spiritual life than when my Christian upbringing, which was non-denominational. Oh, um, okay. I thought you had grown up. I didn't even ask that. That's a good point. No. Yeah. So in my, in my previous non-denominational upbringing, it was very focused on the mind, believing mm -hmm. the right things, checking the correct boxes, um, understanding right like the center of the worship service is not the eucharist or rather the crescendo of the of the of the sunday liturgy which i wouldn't have even called it a liturgy then uh the, of the sunday service was not uh communion or the eucharist and in fact communion only happened maybe once a quarter maybe once a half maybe wow. once a year it just depended and the rest of the year the sunday service was just opening worship song announcements a couple more songs scripture and yeah. it was preaching 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 could last for up to an hour sometimes even more depending and then you close out with a couple worship songs and then you leave now what that bore in me was a love for scripture i love the bible however there was this embodied thing that was missing from all of that because i never you don't in in my upbringing you'd receive god on your tongue you don't receive him into your stomach 
you don't gnaw on God in the bread and and taste him in the wine, right? Like that, ju- that is just so, th- those categories don't even exist. It's not even yeah. possible to think those thoughts. And so if it is in fact true, which it is, that God was incarnate, which he still is, um, then, then, then this physical, the material world around us now becomes um, enchanted in some way. It becomes something by which I can actually draw closer into participating in God's life, into the divine nature, rather than being barred from it because I'm doing physical things. So Ora, Ora et Labora has been a, a sort of a bedrock of my of my own experience, and because of my experience, now my thought. Yeah, that it's it's so fascinating. I didn't. I thought for some reason that you had like grown up in it, and so this is a weird question. But I guess then, do you consider yourself having converted? Some people use the word like co- converted in that context, or is your switching from uh, so-called? I mean, non-denominational always just means low church Protestant. Like it, it certainly doesn't mean. Uh, like Orthodox or, <laughs> or Eastern, uh, you know, a, a, Ch- a Syrian church of the East, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that like <laughs> no. ever, ever. It never means that. Not even a little. Um, <laughs> maybe Mar Mari. I don't know. As some people say it's a questionable structure, mm. but uh, it really doesn't normally mean that. So you kind of switched from non-denominational Protestant to affirming a kind of denominational Protestantism. Do you view that switch as a conversion or how, in what, in what language do you, what language do you use to describe that, that transference? Yeah, I don't, I don't think about it in terms of conversion. When I, when I think about my journey to Anglicanism, it, I would usually maybe say that I was I think confirmation is is the word that I tend to use. Like I was confirmed as an Anglican, um, and I guess I don't know if you want to if you want to get nitpicky. Words mean things, as we'll agree. Uh, then I think maybe conversion might be a, an accurate word, simply because there was so much of my own thinking that had to flip. Like there was there was a, there was a whole in my interior. I was messed up for a long time. Like I just like all of my categories were apart. There's all this, there's all these brothers and sisters that I now have that I didn't think that I, that I didn't thought, I did not at that time think that they were brothers and sisters, right? I was always suspect of anybody who didn't worship at my church. <laughs> uh, and now all of a sudden John 316 means something like really, you know, that like God died for the entire world. Um, the 21 Coptic martyrs, God bless them and rest them. Oh, they, they are, they are the ones that first i had to wrestle with the fact that they died with the name of christ on their tongues they had jesus on their lips which paul saint paul says can only happen by the holy spirit so if it's true that they are these like orthodox christians or whatever and that they died the monophysites (laughs) <laughs> right, <laughs> and they died with Christ on their lips, and Paul says that that can't happen apart from the Holy Ghost. Then, I guess those are my brothers, and I guess that means there's a whole world of Christianity outside of what I've been raised with that is true and good, and I'm completely ignorant of. And so that was kind of what launched me. That not. Not only that moment, there was uh, other circumstances too, but that was a key moment for me in sort of realizing that like, man, I do not know anything. I am like, I am so cut off from some, I remember, I remember reading John 3.16 after that and just like weeping. Like, man, I have, I have so many brothers and sisters out there that I would have neglected. I would have denied our common life in Christ. Um, had I not witnessed that moment and had I not, um, yeah, the, the, it was, uh, it was the Holy spirit doing, doing work in me. And so that was a pro that process took some time, but all that to say, um, the, the, the way that I think of my entry into Anglicanism is not conversion, I guess, in the technical theological sense. Uh, I, I've grown up knowing Jesus my entire life. I was born on a Saturday and I was 
in the nursery the following Sunday, which was the eighth day of my existence, the same day that Jesus was given to the temple to to for his, uh, his circumcision, right? He was presented to the temple. I was presented to the church on my eighth day. Like, uh, and that's where the comparison between me and our Lord basically ends. Um, so, you know, like I have grown up knowing his name. I have grown up uh, never a moment apart from his love. Um, but I, I find that entering into Anglicanism for me and through that into this broader, like this broader idea of the church has been um, a filling in, like a, a, an, a, an affirming, like a yes and. Like, yes, it is true that Jesus is Lord. Yes, it's true that the Bible is good. Yes, it's true that you need to worship on Sundays. And there is so much more for you to know. <laughs> and so it's just been sort of an expansion on that foundation in Christ that I was given. Yeah, it's so beautiful. And if anyone didn't know, the event you were talking about was Daesh or ISIS. And I remember coming out with a little video at the time, but there were 20 or so, a score of Coptic um, or Egyptian martyrs, and then later Ethiopian and Eritrean ones who were crossing the Libyan desert and other parts of North Africa when the um, when Daesh or ISIS was kind of expanding. And what I found so powerful at the time, I, I had a, a hoodie of those uh, original Coptic martyrs that was made and they were canonized very quickly. And I remember an atheist friend mocked me and said, oh, why didn't they just lie about Jesus and escape with their lives? And it, it really showed me the kind of foolishness of the thinking of this world. Um, on the other end, I had some kind of loose acquaintances with reformed or calvinist people even some who were like ethiopian and calvinist you know those, those exist too uh, that common combination <laughs> yeah and 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 they would talk about like their first instinct was the opposite of yours uh and thus i think the opposite of the holy ghost which is that oh these people weren't saved uh in their in their death and, and, and these people, what I found most powerful is, you know, they had these 30 minute videos of beheadings and shootings of these executions of them. And they couldn't find a 30 second clip of a single person denying Christ. And quite to the contrary, I don't know his particular background, but I believe there was a gentleman from Chad who may have been uh, Muslim. And great. You know, it's amazing. There's the memes about people named Chad, but a gentleman from Chad, I believe, who who saw their religion and I think in a Ruth-like manner said, whatever their God is, their God is my God now. And he decided to be martyred along with them. And so mm -hmm. you see the kind of one darker African along with the uh, lighter skinned North Africans in the hoodie and, and the iconography. There's, there's the kind of uh, literal rendering images people have of them, um, which is kind of a little, you know, scarier and more grim. But then there's the idealized with the crowns and, and Jesus above in heaven, crowning the martyrs um, iconography as well that the Coptic church has, has released since that time. But I'm, I'm glad you were able to, to see the kind of different expressions of Christendom. One thing you were really harping on in that transition that stuck out to me is your, uh, this embodiment. And we mentioned technology briefly earlier. I believe actually your top article as a the blue scholar and we'll ask you what you mean by that too because i'm in the pacific uh, northwest now and there's a hip-hop group the blue scholars who i i used to listen to and they even have a, i think a filipino restaurant now called hood famous so i wonder if there are any connections there but um <laughs> your your top article is about uh, the limits of disembodied creativity and uh this great uh I, i'm using an apple laptop and an apple phone uh for a hot spot to talk to you right now <laughs> but uh please please go ahead be ruthless and uh, tell us uh, about your top article on substack yeah so no connection to uh to the hip-hop group um but the, you knew the about them scholar, or... <laughs> i do i only discovered them when i was thinking about what i was going to call the substack um, so I kind of, I found that they existed. I, there was also a, um, I initially was going to be the blue collar scholar. And mm. then, uh, there was, I don't know, like a grant organization that pools money for people that are going into trade school or something like that. And they, they had the name already. So I was like, mm. and, 
And so I shortened it to Blue Scholar because collar is already in the word scholar. And so it just mm -hmm. like, it just, it, was, nice. it was pithy. It kind of captured the idea that I was going for. Like I'm it very much like I'm a, a wrench turner by trade, but then I'm also like, I kind of reflect on what I'm doing. Like I think about it, um, read about it. And so that's the scholar part of it. And then my logo is, uh, is a book and a wrench and then flowers. And so the, the, Flowers are representative of the the material world. The book is representative of our interior world, and then the wrench is is a tool by which we mediate the relationship between our interior and outer worlds. Uh, so it just kind of like encapsulates everything that I think about and and write on. Um, the article that you that you mentioned was a response to the apple ad called crush uh in which they depicted a bunch of creative tools guitars and paints and paintbrushes and cameras and toys and all, all this stuff being crushed under and on an hydraulic press and as the as the press lifts what's left is this sleek thin tablet and you know like as far as marketing goes it's you get the, the message immediately that like all of these things that you currently had to like you had to learn how to play guitar and you had to you know like learn how to woodwork and do these other things to make your toys and all this stuff boom all of it now right here here you go easy enough got it but the problem is that there are uh, and I don't think that Apple was intending any kind of malice in their depiction of things this way, although that is what I think the vast majority of people read. Eh, I don't want to say that anybody was necessarily ascribing malice to them, but I think there's some some different some definite um, there was an, like this apocalyptic moment, I think, in that advertisement where Apple, perhaps unwittingly, was pulling back the veil on the kind of worldview that they have uh and they were not de trying to put on airs of any kind they just like this is kind of like the the telos like the end of apple's project is like we are we're slowly trying to and I don't even like the way I said that. It's not that they're trying to, it's what they are doing is they are producing tools that remove the need for supposedly interacting with the tools and traditions that produce the things that we consider art and interact with mere digital mediations and representations of those same things to produce the things that those traditions and tools would have produced otherwise. And my point in the article is just like, I don't know that I think that's possible. I don't know, like, are, can can we, eat? it was more questions than answers in that particular article. I don't know exactly what the limits of disembodied creativity is. And so kind of my question, what, what a part of, one of the things I'm wondering is, do we, can we call something that's disembodied creative? I think of God, and so my answer is yes. He's not in God the, God the Father. The Trinity is not embodied. God the Son is, uh, and yet the, His incarnation has a moment in time onto eternity. But prior to that point, can we talk about Him as being embodied? Was He Creator God? Yes, He was. So maybe there is something to this. Uh, I don't know. I haven't thought that through. But just like my net my first inclination is to say like okay maybe there is such a thing as disembodied creativity um but is it this yeah like, is this is this what that means mm, mm, I, I don't think so and in fact can we achieve it because we're embodied are we even is it even are we even capable of something like a disembodied creativity and you look at a lot of the things that people produce i know there's a, a friend of mine who's an iconographer and he does beautiful digital rending, renderings of his iconography before putting brush to canvas. Um, and so it's a part of his process. Yeah. But I think the distinction to be made is that 
that's not the end product. Like it goes through the digital mediation to something in the real world. It does not end, it doesn't begin and end digital mediation. Uh, and I think that that is that what I'm exploring is that good tools, what they do is actually point beyond themselves to some further domain of human need rather than being a center a nexus of human activity that creates its own center of gravity and bends the thoughts and actions and wills of humans into its own orbit uh, i think that tools that do that have reached a, a point of being over engineered over efficient um ivan illich a, a philosopher and Roman Catholic priest, he he talks about how uh, he talks about the, this idea of watersheds. There's a first and second watershed, and when tools and technologies reach their first watershed moment, they become productive. They're uh, he would call them convivial. That's his term for it. Um, it actually energizes human relationships. It puts people in possession of their own energies, their own creativity, allows them to virtually bring those things out into the world. Um, it, it doesn't separate people from people, but brings them together in common work. It brings people into deeper connection with their environment. It's convivial. Uh, and that's the first watershed. But then they can continue to produce, or grow rather, and scale. And they, become, they approach what he calls the second watershed, where uh, means and ends become inverted. So a tool or a technology that was originally good at its first watershed now becomes self-referential. It becomes reflexive. It becomes its telos, which used to be out there, is now contained within the tool or the technology itself. And now it's not meeting human needs. Humans must meet its needs. Um, and it, so it becomes manipulative and it, uh, and I'll look no further than the phone yeah. to talk, like to look, look at the kind of manipulation I'm talking about, right? You look, read all these articles about the way that it hacks our brain chemistry and the way that it's, uh, so hyper tinkered to, to attract our every thought and our every motion, um, it, dr drawing us into its own orbit. And, um, and it, which again, we, you and I, our relationship, insofar as we can say that we have one, has been mediated primarily through X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, and now here we are having something like a face to face conversation. And please, God, I hope that one day we can hug each other's necks and, oh, and shake each other's hands and worship together. Like, I would love that. And that would be an incredible use of the technology, right? Is that it actually produced something real in the real world beyond itself. Um, but if it merely remains in, in an abstract dimension, then uh, there, that just opens up all kinds of other possibilities for things that aren't as humane or as, as humanly oriented. Um, we become the product rather than we be, we become um, passively mastered by the technology rather than us mastering the technology and using it as ends beyond it. So that's the kind of the the gist of the article. And I did a follow up article to that that explored it a little bit deeper because um, it got me. In that first article, I was like, oh, there's a Tower of Babel reference mm -hmm. here somewhere. Like, there's an analogy, but I haven't worked it out. So I wrote another one, and that's where I, I really spent some time thinking about Tower of Babel as sort of this archetypal lens for understanding Apple's ad and what Apple thought it was doing. And, um, and then I, I, go, I go deeper there. But, yeah, that's the, the gist. Which to rule them all. Uh-huh, <laughs> uh exactly. <laughs> Yeah, Genesis 11 for those who want to catch up on the background there. But yeah, that's it's it's really a fantastic way to say it. And I always tell people the philosophy of art and science for me is a kind of catch-all title that lets me talk about whatever I want with whoever I want. But what you just mentioned and these two connected articles is the very heart of what drew me to 
Uh, I, I like calling it broadcasting now since we're no longer on the pod, uh, but just, you know, podcasting, but broadcasting. And, and that was these deep questions. Um, you know, we're not hypocrites. We're, we're using the institution's tools. We're within the institution, but that doesn't mean we're not allowed to critique it from within while using the product, you're allowed to review it. And in fact, it's it's that process through its users and through the leadership that is a part of the entire iterative developmental life cycle that all these technologists have to go. So, so your feedback is, is very important for them to know that. And it's a classic science fiction question as well. I went to the uh, Sacred Arts Conference this past March, I think it was the end of March at, uh, St. Andrew's Orthodox Church in Riverside, which is pastored by Father Josiah Trenum, and one of the guest speakers was Father Maximus Constus. The other was uh, Jonathan Pagiot, which everyone's been getting used to of late on the internet as well. And one of the things that they discussed was the kind of beauty of digital age in creating digital icons, um, like your friend, the iconographer is using both though. And they said that doesn't stop you from then supporting these people who have picked up the trade of iconography in this time, uh, which can't possibly be as profitable except in some rare cases as, as so many other careers and professions at the same time of getting the embodied icon from them which continues this tradition and this artistry and there's a way in which the you know it's great for me to have wallpaper on my phone that's a digital icon um, but it's also great that there are still people creating embodied icons that i could hang up and and use in my prayer corner at home and that we can have walled in in the churches you know <laughs> i don't think our churches anytime soon or maybe we'll have wall-to-wall -wall digital icons i don't think we're ready for that although with plasma uh, screens it's possible yeah yeah no you mentioned uh a minute ago which i love father maximus constas by the way um along with Peugeot, and uh, i don't know father trenum is as well i know his internet presence seen clips but i don't i'm not familiar with him uh as such but uh maximus constas has uh, a wonderful um series on patristic nectar which is uh i don't know if you're familiar that's with father josiah's program that's father josiah's program oh is it yeah how about that look at that <laughs> uh where he talks about um another one of my another one of my favorites uh saint basil he's got a, a wonderful series of lectures on saint basil i think five actually um anyway but before you mentioned them um i think we segued by talking about like critiquing the institution from within the institution critiquing the technology from within the technology which let's be honest that's the only way that that's the only people that actually can offer critique really right are the people who are in it um people who uh have or you know are ballsy enough to critique plumbing without having ever plumbed <laughs> it's like you know i don't i don't put as much stock in what you have to say about this because like you don't know the trade um yeah. so i think there's something there but um there's a technologist or sorry not a technologist a a uh critic a philosopher a critic um l michael sacassis he writes a, a wonderful newsletter on substack called the convivial society Convivial is that word that I mentioned Ivan Illich uses. He's yes. influenced by Ivan Illich. He also, uh, society is a reference to Jacques Ellul's uh, The Technological Society. So it's Ellul and Illich and combines them together. The Convivial Society, that's his newsletter. You should read it. Um, not you only. Your listeners should also read it. Um, it's incredible. But he has a series of essays that he put together in a book called The Frailest Thing. Uh, which is available online. He offers it for whatever people want to pay, whether that's zero dollars or a thousand dollars or anything in between. Uh, and so uh, in one of those essays, he gives 10 points of unsolicited advice for tech writers. And uh, one of the points is when someone criticizes a specific technology without renouncing all other forms of technology, they are not being hypocritical, they are thinking. So that just reminded me of what you said a moment ago, where it's like we're not being hypocrites by using this stuff. It just means that we're thinking about it like it's we're, we're questioning from within the ecosystem whether or not this is the best thing for us, um, how we might use these things in a more humanizing way and a more in a way that is holier, that is 
uh, more in line with making us further participants in the divine nature. Um, ways that glorify God that are for the good of the people around us. Uh, we can only we can only answer these questions by being deeply invested uh, in in the institutions and the technologies and the tools. So anyway, I thought that was an interesting uh, thing that you had mentioned that because I just wrote, read that recently and I was like, huh. Yeah, that's yeah. cool when when the uh, you know great minds think alike when those thoughts line up in in different um, phrases. You mentioned the plumbing again, so let's talk about that in particular. I believe uh, what prompted this conversation and it should have happened uh, long ago, but we're happy that it happens on God's time. Is that yeah. you were recently doing a plumbing class? Was it for men? And I so I wanted to to hear about that. I, I found that so fascinating, and it was actually. Um, a Muslim thinker, like sadly, he, he grew up Greek Orthodox and converted to Islam. But I think he's a powerful thinker, Sheikh Hamza. He's got the uh, uh, the liberal arts Muslim college in Berkeley. And he, uh, I've heard him speak before, it's actually originally against and from a traditionalist Islamic perspective, Daesh and ISIS, which is around the time of the martyrs that we were thinking about. But I have heard him say this thing that I have always stressed in my own ministry. And so I appreciated hearing it elsewhere was he he stressed the honorability of the trades it's uh, i don't know how it is in your community but in ethiopian community as with many immigrant communities to the united states there's um in what is in my opinion an overemphasis on highly on being highly educated and of course i love education and some people will call me a hypocrite because I, I went through it you know i don't have a phd but i went through the masters or a graduate level but this is an old debate which goes back to the black american community w.e.b du bois and um if i'm not mistaken booker t washington and it's about how to get a path forward and and my firm belief is in trying to make peace between these and that a few people i don't have an exact number for you should go the highly educated route if they can go be your doctor engineer lawyer whoever you want but I think what's underrated are the trades and that we need more plumbers, electricians and mechanics and, and everything of the sort. So I would love to hear um, if you if there is any sort of um, prestige battles in your community around the trades and and just about your experience, like talking about plumbing with uh, the folks in your community. Yeah. Um... No prestige battles. Uh, I do think that there is still a common, in spite of the fact that a public personality like Mike Rowe, uh, who people may know from uh, a long-standing show called Dirty Jobs, who was on Discovery Channel for a lot of years, beginning in, I think, 2003. Um, and he's gone on to he's a voiceover artist for deadliest catch another popular show for a long time um ford commercials you've probably heard his voice in ford commercials if you're a tv watcher uh mike rowe has been banging the blue collar drum like singularly for two, over two decades and um just bringing a spotlight to the fact that the trades are uh slighted and unjustly so and that they are a path worthy of not we don't need to swing the pendulum to the other side and say that like trades are better than intellectual or knowledge work but just that they are an really valid and noble path to take there there's there ought not to be uh, a class distinction made between those who labor with their hands and those who labor with their minds. We need, we require both. It, we, we need both of, we need people who are thinking about the organization of our societies, of our polis, uh, so that we can live in a way that is conducive to uh, human flourishing. We also need people who actually build society, the polis around us, uh, so that we can inhabit that space and interact with one another in a way that trends toward human flourishing. Like we need both sides of that, and for so long, um, in, at the the national level conversation, uh, there's been this push for college, 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 college. I'm also a fan for of education, particularly for its own sake, not as a certification program to get you a job, um, which is what it's become, but as uh, a per, the pursuit of wisdom. 
um, the loving pursuit of wisdom philosophy, right? And uh, as a way of uh, enriching ourselves so that we do flourish humanly. That's what education is for. Uh, I, as such, I do, I, I have an education, but I have just taken the route of being an autodidact. I didn't go past high school. Um, I worked a customer service job before entering into plumbing. And it's actually in the context of plumbing that I learned how to think. It was, it was the trade uh -huh. that gave, that gave me the capacity for clearer thought. It didn't keep me from thinking. It encouraged me to think. And it encouraged me to, um, I don't know, there's just, there's so much that you have to balance when you go into a job. There's the, the emotional world of the customer that's in front of you. There's diagnosis, which is not the same thing as building something from scratch. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff that you have to deal with. It actually requires keener, sharper thinking uh, rather than just going in, wiping the snot on your sleeve pulling on pants so that you cover your butt crack and then get to work, you know, <laughs> um, which that's kind of like the way that people look at it and think about it. And there's so much more going on. So all of that hey, to, to get to actually answering your question, which was in my own community that the class that I hosted, um, first of all, my employer, uh, I, I'm no longer in the field turning wrenches on a daily basis. I am a plumber by trade, but I don't do it to earn my daily bread anymore. Uh, I'm an instructor. Uh, so I teach plumbing um, and I also am involved in instructional design for nice. other trades and divisions within my work. Um, we are the largest home services, in, um, home services company in the Atlanta market. So we have a huge customer base. Uh, we have a huge service area. We cover like the north half of the state, basically. Um, and we have a huge fleet. There are, are hundreds and hundreds of our vehicles out there doing plumbing, HVAC, electrical, home insulation, water filtration. We do a number of different trades. So anytime that a, a division wants to create a training or, or flesh out an idea that they're, you know, a new product or some that, then I have a hand in helping to create that that teaching material um and i even do some of the teaching on my own um so i just kind of took this skill set of teaching that i've cultivated and i was like the reason i got into the trade in the first place was one because i needed to make money but two like i wanted to be able to do something that would meet practical need it at my church like for the people that i go to church like i wanted to be able to take care of them in some real tangible way and there are a few things more real and more tangible than poop. Uh, that is like, that's like the most like base level, um, sometimes humiliating thing. And like, I get to take care of people in like a very, very basic way. So um, I had proposed the idea to my church of, hey, I've got this, this classroom, I've got this fully functioning lab uh that's all plumbed in we've got four five different toilets uh you know shower faucets tankless water heaters standard tank type water heaters we've got all this stuff set up can i take a group of of guys and it's it would have been men and women except that the men's ministry was looking for something to do and so i got a little bit of pushback on socials when people were like why was it only men it's like because my men's group needed something to do uh so we grabbed all the guys and said hey uh why don't we let me save you money let me let me take let me take some of the things that you probably already have the tools for nothing proprietary no tool that you're gonna have to go out and buy just with a wrench um a pair of pliers and uh, uh a screwdriver um let me let me teach you like four or five things that you can do on your own at home so that you don't have to call a plumber. So you don't have to call me. Uh, like, I don't have to come do it for you. You can do it for yourself. And so I brought them in, gave them some, like, basic theory on uh, toilets. And uh, we looked at all the parts and identified them and named them. And then um, went over some common issues that you'll encounter. home. Here's what this noise typically means. Here's what this smell typically means. Um, when it looks like this, here's what this might mean. And then went into the lab and walk them through uh, how to work on toilets, how to work on faucets, how to check their own home water pressure, um, and just hopefully gave them a little bit of autonomy over their, over their own house. That was the goal. So yeah, it was great.
I, I felt good from the front. Like, I guess you'd have to ask them to know like how it really went and whether or not they got anything valuable out of it. But I felt it was great. Uh, I, I love talking about the trade and kind of geeking out on it. And I love that I got to do it in service to my church community. So it was really beautiful. Yeah, it's it's so beautiful and uh, practical. And so funny that you put together the words, the theory, toilet theory, right? The theory of the toilet, because when I was the inspiration for the name of my podcast came from when I was in my undergraduate studies and my favorite class was the philosophy of art. My favorite thing about it was that you had white collar and blue collar and so many different backgrounds, uh, creative writing, political science, just everyone from different backgrounds came and to discuss and have these kind of discussions on art. And actually, the first piece of art we went over is from Marcel Duchamp, which is in 1917. And it's that of a toilet, a toilet that was, was part of these artworks called ready mades where they took like normal objects and try to display them in modern art fashion in museums. Mm. And I think one of the first one was uh, a toilet. I think later someone did like a, a, a urinal, like but there's different versions of this that people did. Um, my favorite comedian is... Uh, Dave Chappelle, I think of comedy because my first introduction even to the term blue collar were the blue collar comedy people uh, of yes. those like Larry the Cable Guy and stuff. Ron White yep. is probably the only one I still listen to because he's associated with Rogan and, and that new comedy starship in uh, Mothership in Austin, Texas, which is pretty amazing. But like that's yeah. how I learned about blue collar comedy. But even uh, Dave Chappelle, which kind of represents the black comedy scene in the East Coast in Washington, D.C. And, and New York, even though he's based in Ohio now, around some of these great blue collar folks in Ohio, he always said all of his jokes are just elaborate stories and narratives that all go back to poop somehow. So, <laughs> so it, it really is like, uh, a building block and a, fo a foundation of our uh, society. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you got to spread that knowledge with people. And I, and I wish more and more people did that. On my podcast, I had as a former guest, a friend of mine who's a deacon and, um, and an engineer by trade, but he kind of is a self-taught DIY mechanic. And uh, he, uh, he welded shut on my Prius on the bottom, the uh, the catalytic converter, because in the Los Angeles area and the greater Southern California, there was a, a huge amount of thefts of catalytic converters. And I had him do a tutorial on what to do about that on my YouTube channel. After that, I personally know like 10 to 13 people who got their catalytic converters stolen. And, mm. you know, I'm not the guy to say I told you so, but hey, I made a free YouTube video with the guy to like, to not just for my church community, but like anyone who's watching the channel to just yeah. please save yourselves because there are thieves afoot. And so I'm I'm so glad that that you were able to, to pour into your to your community that day. I didn't even make the connection till now, but I uh, recently because I was at the end of the year um, substitute teaching this past year at a public school, and uh, they put on the uh, Super Mario Bros movie, and of course yeah. that's the. Uh, that's the epitome of the cartoon character in your field. Were you ever growing up uh, a Mario fan? I don't know if you saw the the film that came out, uh, but I showed it to some high schoolers. It came out last year. Oh yeah, I the movie, and uh, I was a huge Super Mario fan as a kid. Uh, never aspired to be him, but I did. <laughs> I did love him. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the games. Uh, in fact, one of my earliest memories is I may have been three years old my my parent this is in the early 90s i was born in 1990. um oh, me early too. 90s <laughs> wow. hey look at that um there were there was a summer where there was some rolling brownouts that were happening i i grew up in long beach california um and there was uh we had a <laughs> named after our governor was, at the time right <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah exactly no we had a super nes and I had Super Mario World, or Super Mario World, I think, or Super Mario World 2 or something like that. And I just remember, maybe I was four years old, it getting pretty far into the game. And then uh, a brownout happened. And when I when I came back to the game, my progress hadn't been saved. And oh, I, was, no. I was a sad boy. But, uh, but yeah, so like Super Mario, interestingly, has actually factored into my imaginative world for a long time. Um, I just never thought that I would follow in his footsteps. And even then, like, that's, you know, that's yeah. a, a loose rendering of following in his footsteps because I'm not, like, uh, 
smashing Goombas uh, <laughs> or or fighting Bowser. I uh, yeah. am doing some other more more mundane things, but uh, but yeah, I I love the the franchise. The movie I thought was really really well done. I love the way that they handled the accents. Like mm-hmm. what they like that that was a big question is like you know like how's Chris Pratt gonna do like a terrible Italian accent and like just the way that they factored that into the into the storyline I thought was funny. Uh, the Jack Black song Peaches iconic. You know can't get enough of it. My daughters can't get enough of it. God help me. Beautiful. Um, yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, I I even found a religious element to it. I don't know if you saw it. It's because I've been uh, teaching it, uh, the past couple of years, one, once at a public school and once at a Catholic school, actually, the uh, kind of Indian history. And I've come to know this uh, this kind of Buddhist myth that it's been or, or story in India and in China, which has found its way in many um, animes. But then the countries kind of come out with like official cartoon and live action versions as well. So I've seen this story several times, but this archetype of the monkey king, I, I had never put two and two together, but it's 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 in Dragon Ball, it's in One Piece and it's in Donkey Kong. And so the way Mario in the film has to fight Donkey Kong and then gets Donkey Kong on his side and gets these monkey warriors, it's like a very old religious story that comes out of South and East Asia. Mm. I did not pick up on that. I am familiar with the Monkey King story, one, because I also watched the Toonami block on Cartoon Network in the yeah. 90s. <laughs> I, I also grew up on Dragon Ball, the D- Dragon Ball franchise. Uh, I still occasionally want to Crunchyroll and catch up on uh, yeah. Dragon Ball Super and um, watch some of the movies and stuff. But, <clears throat> but I also... Um, I studied Mandarin in high school. That was my second language. Wow. And so um, I, uh, the, the Monkey King figure, um, I, I'm i not a scholar. I barely speak Chinese anymore. Um, I'm, I'm not like in any way, um, probably more than your average person. I still know more Mandarin. But um, yeah, the, the Monkey King figure, I, I noticed that both in some of the texts that we would read when I got into like AP Chinese 3 and 4, and then like oh like this is the dragon ball z yeah. like that's crazy how'd they know and uh Including so yeah the nimbus uh, cloud and the really huge stick <laughs> the whole thing like almost just ripped it right out of the pages of of uh historical literature yeah and um but i i missed that in super mario that was really that's a really good observation i had i hadn't seen that yeah it's just cool to see the same story kind of retold and it's um in different manifestations and seeing that even when people say something like my favorite thing in teaching Indian history is getting kids who have no background in it, like the ones who have some sort of continental background, they know this, but just like a simple idea of people who think they're secular, but then they like have a dogmatic belief in karma. And I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. let's, that's cool. But do you know, that's like one of the dogmas of Hinduism and there are no real dogmas, but if there was one, it's like karma and dharma, you know? So karma yeah, yeah. is one of them. Most people don't really know dharma, which is like duty and obligation, but, but karma, almost everyone, you know, believes in. And when we were kids, Justin Timberlake would sing about it in his own way. What comes around goes around, but like mm-hmm. people really believe in it in, a, in a, on a cosmic level some middle schoolers and high schoolers, and they don't realize that it's uh, really a teaching of Hinduism and these things that that, that come out of um, the subcontinent and, and East Asia um, as well. I, I remember also actually, um, I, I won't shout his name, he changes his name a lot, so I'll, I'll uh, uh, you know respect his uh, OPSEC, but the guy who introduced us, I was looking back a couple of years ago, he had showed and shared an Ethiopian icon with you that you had me read, and I was rereading it Today, I was um, looking at it and I, I didn't plan this at all, which is incredible, uh, you know, but the time that we're shooting this, uh, as I told you about a week ago, was the ascension of Christ. And I don't know where this this idea comes from, but I think I've heard this patristic idea before that uh, the, the icon, I should say, is of uh, Mount Tabor, which is where the Ethiopian church believes the transfiguration or metamorphosis of Christ takes place. And he has uh, Moses and uh, my father's name, say Elias or Elijah, as well as the so-called pillars of Galatia and the early Christian community before Paul. 
which is uh, James, John, and Peter, or Jacob, John, and Peter, is James' is a mistranslation. And um, some people have this, that's the icon, but there's a patristic idea that it was uh, from his going up into the sky or ascension that he kind of gets that wonderful bright white aura on uh, Mount Tabor, as we say, or just you could say, if you think it's on a different mountain, uh, we're not going to be like the Samaritans and argue about Mount Gerizim and other mountains. But the 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 beauty and the kind of aura that is emanating and oozing out of him when he is uh, then told to the apostles that he is the beloved son in whom God is well pleased. Yeah, I, it's so funny because I actually looked at my DMs a couple of days ago and uh, I think when when you when we were dimming like last week setting this up uh i went back and yeah uh saw that same icon and then looked at it again and maybe i'll pick your brain a little bit because i don't know that we ever had this conversation so the the perspective in the icon and i don't know if this is uh unique to um this is an, this is an ethiopian uh, icon correct yes um but the use of perspective in iconography is always really fascinating to me because there's a lot communicated through it that you wouldn't in its like in the fact that it's not to scale let's say that it doesn't match like normal dimensions so in in this particular icon you've got the transfigured christ uh with moses and elias on either side of him but then you've got peter john and James slash Jacob, who are are like behind, ostensibly down, yeah. But like, but it's but they're kind of like poking up and behind the transfigured Lord, and it almost gives the appearance that like you're on top of the mountain watching the transfiguration happen, and then you're like looking down at them. So the use of perspective is like you're with the Lord, um, seeing him as transfigured there uh whereas uh you would expect you have the perspective of the disciples at the base of the mountain and like looking up it like puts you there with him and i just think it's an interesting thing that iconography does um i think also of the uh oof, i know it's got a name i don't remember the name forgive me it's uh just like kind of your standard uh icon of the theotokos uh with christ and uh, i think people call it the madonna and, in the west in the ethiopian tradition we call it which means with her beloved son mm, it's beautiful yeah and there's only one scene in scripture that depicts her holding him like that and it's when she's handing christ to uh the prophet simeon uh in the temple and so the idea, but to my understanding, the idea is that uh, it's almost as if you are Simeon and and our blessed mother is handing Christ to you. And so just like there's so much more to iconography that people I, I that have a background like I do anyway, yeah. uh, don't don't appreciate soon enough. Uh, there's just there's so much to contemplate and to. Uh, to savor in iconography that I, I really appreciate. I, I don't know, interested in, in your thoughts on the way I'm seeing the, um, the the icon of Mount Tabor and the transfiguration. Yeah, I see, I see your uh, view of that perspective the same way. And the thing that is, uh, to, to borrow from your language earlier, both like infuriating and delighting about the Ethiopian tradition is that we don't really have like a formal body that like censors in terms of like the Catholic mm -hmm. church. And so the iconography is just vastly different. You know, Jonathan Peugeot likes to pass the, to point this out as well. It's like, we have no canons about painting or writing God the Father. And so you'll see God the Father. Sometimes you'll see God the Spirit in bodily form too. Uh, and I don't just mean like as a dove, I mean, as an old man. And and so like there really are no rules and there's a there's a great diversity of practice and so I think you'll see you probably find some where they're more represented on the bottom of the mountain but in this particular icon 
Christ is the center. And uh, what I could add to what your analysis is, is we're with the Lord, we're with the transfigured Christ or the metamorphosed Christ at the top of the hill, kind of looking down at the pillars uh, of the apostles with Moses and Elijah as they are you know, meant to disappear into him, uh, the law and the prophets. I, I, I think I see also a sort of um, a very circular nature to this. And a lot of the church buildings in Ethiopia are circularly made. And so there's this idea of the of infinity or of timelessness in that space too. You know, what type of what where on the timeline are Moses, Elias, uh, J, James or Jacob, John and Peter? You know, how are they all getting together? And um I, I don't know so much because, you know, Moses died. So that's more interesting um, right before seeing the promised land. But Elias is, of course, whisked into the heavens, one of the only people that never dies. And so it's my father's name. And he named me Enoch or Henoch after him as well. One of the only ones uh, also that did not die. And so Elias, there's an argument through the timelessness of being whisked away uh, from the fiery chariot and not seeing death, that he could go and get transported to that wherever mountain it was of transfiguration. Um, Moses is a little harder, but with the resurrected Lord, you know, anything is possible. And with the ascended Lord, anything is possible as well. Oh, man. One other feature I, I really love about Ethiopian iconography is uh, the fingers, bro. The fingers are incredible. <laughs> that is that is a favorite. I don't know why I like that so much, but it's yeah. just like it, it's they're so the you know, abnormal elongation. Yeah, they're just so long. <laughs> like, like, why do you have these sticks on the end of your hands? Uh, yeah. But they're you know they're uh, like it, you really do follow like where they're pointing. Like your eyes yeah. like in this icon that we're that we're both <laughs> looking at like everyone is pointing towards the lord and towards the scriptures like even like G jesus is pointing at the text like at the scriptures in his hand um i guess something like that he he is the fulfillment thereof and elias and and moses like it, they are all in him and so anyway yeah i um i really uh I really, I've, I've, I've thought about this a couple times and it's it's fun to kind of chop this one up with you that was uh that was good yeah, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure um, and I won't hold you any longer. Can you please, if you have any closing message and then properly plug where they can find the Blue Scholar so they could find all of your wonderful writings as well. I know you have a growing following on Substack and so we'll plug all the links uh, wherever this is available. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, so I I, actually, I have the, the honor of uh, pre this coming Sunday and uh, we're we're in First Samuel chapter nine, and that'll be my text for my homily. And something that has been very much—it's crazy the way that God has lined this up. Not crazy. Um, I shouldn't be surprised, but here we are. God uses circumstances that we would not choose for ourselves to be the means by which if we will humbly submit ourselves to his will that he will reveal christ the king um it is it is if we will accept the the various circumstances of our life that we do not choose that we would not choose for ourselves and in fact that we would long to even escape from um he can and will use those moments those circumstances to reveal christ uh and and if you as a christian feel that you would not like to be in a situation any longer uh, i think what i would encourage is the knowledge that that does not make you a bad christian um that you are not a faithless follower of jesus merely because you find your circumstances difficult or undesirable um and in fact uh our lord himself asked the father that the chalice would pass from his lips um and and so you're in good company and yet he did in fact drink from the chalice and he did take up his cross and he did die and it was in that moment of suffering that he most fully revealed this is father john bear um you know that jesus shows us what it means to be god and the way that he dies as a human being dies on the cross as a human being uh, it is precisely in suffering that we find most often the full revelation of 
King Jesus. So uh, if that is your situation, then um, plod, plod forward and know that God is with you and um, that he cares for you. That would be, I think, some final words, not in not particularly like related to anything that was said i don't think but uh but that's just what's on my heart right now that's um good. as as far as a plug goes um i am on x slash twitter oblate nate and the the blue scholar substack uh which is the blue scholar dot substack dot com uh be happy to have you along for the ride